Good morning. We're thinking about last week, this week, and next week, how we can be a blessing to the coming generations. You know, how often do we think about that? How much thought goes into that? Because, you know, the more that I meditate on the idea of being a blessing to those to come after, the more I think about setting up and stabilizing this church in such a way that it does not matter the winds that howl against it or the waves that crash against it or the pressures that are put down on it, that it will stand and that it will stand until the Lord returns, however long that might be. We, we do not know, but it should be. It should be the desire and the intention and the, the forward movement of the church to say, if the Lord does not return for a thousand years, we want to still be standing. I will not be here. You will not be here. But what can we do right now to put it into a position with, with, it, with everything that's given to us within our faculties, within our abilities to be a blessing? <clears throat> so I think one of the ideas is we have to have a vision of what we desire to be. We have to have something so great in mind that we're looking forward to that we would desire. If we could say, what will this place be in 50 years? If you were to pin down the ideal picture a glorious picture of what the church could be and what the church should be and all of the things that the Lord would have us chasing after right now. What would you paint? Well, let me tell you what I see. I see a church that is more than a few members on the outskirts of town. What if we were a feature of the town? What if we were a city set on a hill that shaped local policies and the ways that things were governed? What if the leaders here and the members here and the teachers here and those involved were actively sought out by members of Kingfisher for marital counsel, practical wisdom, and questions of ethics and philosophy or religion? all of the practical, difficult questions that are being asked by people on the daily, what if we beat out Google as the number one place to search for that information, at least in this region? What if a large segment of local businesses were run by our members? We were a productive bunch. The town, the community, the city was reliant on the productivity and the ethicality and the good work of members who were living under the reign of Jesus Christ, knowing that he's the king. And these businesses had favorable reputations within the community for charity and benevolence and excellence in business. What do you envision that this church is going to be in 50 years? I see a church of 300 or 400 or 500, maybe more, in which a large group of shepherds oversees the work. A big number of deacons are at service within the work. And there are multiple ministries that are happening. I see our church as an education center for all ages, including graduates, grad, graduates who wish to pursue studies in theology and ministry. I see our church as a center for leadership development, a place where young people are mentored and trained for excellence in ministry and leadership. I see our church as a unified and multicultural community in which we have services in the languages that are spoken by the people in our community, both English and Spanish, and perhaps if there were others. I see a church filled with youth who together with the old 
lift their voices to the Lord in sincere worship because it's expected of them and because they're actively challenged to be better and brighter and more engaged spiritually. Their Bible classes will be theologically robust and will address the kinds of issues that they're facing in public every day and will give them answers and substance on how to combat these difficulties and how to answer for them when their peers are bringing different kinds of pressures. Members both old and, and young will have a strong understanding of what it means to be holy and separate and they will do so unashamedly because the support from this body will provide for them everything that they need for endurance and conviction and belonging. We will have business owners, local politicians, engineers, doctors, nurses, professors, farmers, cooks, teachers, artists, mechanics, electricians, and carpenters, all of whom will use their unique skill sets to aid the church. Everyone will understand that they have a place in the body to be at work for the body and to use their abilities and their unique, unique talents, talents from the Lord to help build up. As a church, we will set the standard for unity, showcasing before the world what it meant when Jesus broke down in his body the dividing wall of hostility. I often look forward to these days that are far off. And I think, what, not only what could we be, but what should we be? Or is there a thing in that vision that the Lord would not will? Is there a thing in that picture that the Lord would say, I, I don't want that? Aren't those the things that the Lord desires? More growth, more productivity, more leadership, all of the resources necessary to help bring down the philosophies and the, the destructive demonic influences that are taking people captive where they are being lost. It, what of these things does the Lord not want? I think he wants all of these things. And so why shouldn't we chase them? Why shouldn't we look forward and say, we can be that. We will be that. We will put all of our talents, all of our resources, all of our abilities together to become that. And by the Lord's blessing, we will be as he wills. We will plant and we will water, expecting a harvest like that, knowing the Lord's going to be the one to bring the harvest. We cannot affect growth. We cannot, be, we do not do that. God does that. But if we only scatter into a tiny garden, the yield we should expect will be very small. But if we scatter into a large field, how much more will come from it? Look, I mean, we can be honest. When we look around in the world as it's going today, you know, and, and, I, and I do want to say, we, had, we do have good news the other day. Brother Barry mentioned it in his prayer, but, you know, the, the overturning of Roe versus Wade after 50 years is no longer a co constitutional right to abort a baby. Amen. So, so that's good. We have a long ways to go, but when you look around in this culture and society, there's a lot of things that are broken. We, we don't need anybody to point out to us the things that are broken and, and the things that shouldn't be the way that they are. We could, we could probably talk forever about it. Just turn on the news and you'll see all about it. But when you're looking out at these issues that, that do exist, we don't want to be unrealistic, we don't want to pretend that they're not there, I do think that there are two really bad things that the church and the people of God could do. And I talked about one of them last week, which was one of the responses. So I'll, I'll give you two responses that are bad and we don't want to have this kind of response. One of them is to do like Hezekiah. Remember, Isaiah came to Hezekiah and he said, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming. Hezekiah is king of Judah. Hezekiah had been prospered richly. Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when 
all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. It's going to be taken from you. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your own sons, Hezekiah, who, who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. I can't imagine a worse picture for my boys than that they would be emasculated and put into the service of a pagan king. Can you imagine a worse thing? God said that to Hezekiah. That's what's going to happen, Hezekiah. And Hezekiah responded like this. The word of the Lord that you have spoken is good. For he thought, why not if there will be peace and security in my days? We don't want to react like that. If you see the writing on the wall that what our children is going to inherit is not going to be good, to say, well, so long as it happens after I've parted from this world, that's fine. That is the wrong perspective. That is not the divine perspective. That's not the, the way God wants us to see this. He wants there to be a churning in our bellies where we'd say, okay, I see what it looks like they might inherit, and therefore, what am I going to do? And we talked last week about what would be the thing. I mean, this is what we're doing. We're building on this idea of what can we do right now to set up and bless not only our, our progeny as fathers, and as family units, but also what can we do to bless this church here for the days when we're gone from it? What can we do and what should we do? And one of the things that I said is, well, we have to fight the battles that are on our doorstep right now. Right? Um, we have to fight these battles. You're, they're here right now. We can't put our heads in the sand. We can't do, we can't pretend that they're just going to go away on their own. The church has to wage the war. The church has to be on the ideological front lines to say we will present truth, we will bring truth, we will expose falsities, and we will make these things known. But the other thing that the church could do that's, that's not good, because I don't think that most people in this room are going to be like Hezekiah and say, I just don't care. But, but here's the more common one. I was listening the other day to some guys that were talking about the conservative movement within the United States and really, you know, breaking open, what are we really conserving? If you're just looking at broadly, um, like cultural conservatism as it exists now, and it's really not conserving anything, not much. You know, um, Dave Rubin and his partner, um, his, his homosexual partner are adopting two children and the conservative movement, you know, Prager University and the Daily Wire and these groups that are all quote unquote conservative are praising this. What are we conserving if we're not conserving the most foundational institution of society, the family? But he's saying, but here's the thing. One of the things that you do see, one of the things that the conservative movement is really good at doing is being critical and critiquing and doing a lot of yelling. You just turn on the news. Turn on Fox News. Now, you might agree with them. You, you might say, I'm glad somebody's calling this out. I'm glad that somebody is saying this is not the way that it should be. But here's the question. How much help are we going to be for those to come after us if the only thing we can do is criticize the way things are and not put something in place to say, here's how it should be and here's how we're going to get there. Here's our plan going forward. Here's what we're going to build. So the idea is if we want to bless the people of tomorrow, yes, we do need to understand there is a war to be fought. There are ideas that we need to call out. We do need to say these things are, are wrong. They're unethical. They're, you know, they're going to destroy us societally. We have to be willing to do that. But at the same time, we have to be willing to... Um, offer something. So the two things that the church could do that we don't want to do is, one, we could be apathetic and say, I don't care, or at least I'm not going to think about what's going to come. We don't want to do that. And we also don't want to just go out and do a bunch of yelling and saying it shouldn't be this way and, you know, reflecting on the glory years. The other day, um, somebody sent me a, a, a little rap of about millennials and it, it, was, it was an older fella and I'm a millennial so he was trying to, he was getting me 
and it was a rap about millennials and something about not being productive and you know all the different things and I just said well I, I mean I guess we can blame you guys for raising us so poorly because we all we all own it to some degree right we have to look forward and say what are we going to give what are we going to provide so Here's what I want to do. I want to start off by reading something from Nehemiah. And I think that this helps create a balance in, in what we're doing. Because, you know, last week I mentioned something Spurgeon said, uh, Charles Spurgeon, a preacher of, of great note from a long time ago. You remember, he, he said, look, you sirs there are ages yet to come if the lord does not speedily appear there will come another generation and another and all these generations will be tainted and injured if we're not faithful to god and to his truth today we've come to a turning point in the road if we turn to the right mayhap our children and our children's children will go that way but if we turn to the left generations yet unborn will curse our names for having been unfaithful to god and to his word and spurgeon was calling for the church saying you do need to fight you do need to have a sword in hand now the weapons of our warfare are not physical we are not wielding literal swords are we 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 do this is our sword this is how we go wage the war. It's with the ideas that are brought forward in this book. And we do need to fight, but we also need to build. And I think that we see that picture in the book of Nehemiah. Israel had been in captivity for 70 years. A whole generation now had, had literally just grown up. You know, the former generation had gone there, had children. And these people had lived their entire lives in Babylon and they're going back now. And so Nehemiah is kind of on the front lines of this as Israel is going to start beginning their transition back to their homeland. And this is what it says. God had come to Nehemiah and God had said, I need you to understand what you're going to see when you go back to your homeland. You're going to see a city and a place that's in disarray. You're going to see walls that have been destroyed, dilapidated structures. It will not be prosperous. It will not be beautiful. It will not look good. What has happened there is war has torn through it and all of the glory of the former days has been destroyed. If Nehemiah were a boomer, he may just complain about all that used to be and how it wasn't that way at all anymore. But that isn't what he did. Nehemiah went back. He says, I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. <clears throat> I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall. All he sees is destruction everywhere. He's going out by night looking at the, what has happened to the city of God, the city that was to be benevolent, to prosper, the one that was to be a beacon, a city on a hill, the one that was to be productive and glorious. And he saw nothing but destruction. And he turned back and entered by the valley and so returned. And then it says... Nehemiah says, I said to them, so he goes back to the leaders after he'd gone and scouted. He said, I said to them, you see the trouble we're in. And can I ask that same thing? You see the trouble we're in. Do you see the, the trouble we're in? Do you see the trouble we're in? When little boys are told they can be girls? And when we have people saying that at the age of five, they can make a permanent decision for their body and destroy the image of God on them and have a surgery, they, they can't even pick their meals for the day. They can't even vote in an election, but we can change their gender. Do we see the trouble that we're in? Do you see the trouble we're in when we take age-old marriage, goes back to the foundations of the world, and we say it can be whoever, with whoever, whenever? Do we see the trouble that we're in? 
Do we see our children that are on antipsychotics and antidepressants and anxiety medication in alarming numbers? Do we see the trouble we're in? Nehemiah is like this. He's getting back and he's saying, look at what's happened. It used to be so good, but he says, do, he, he says, you see the trouble we're in. We can say that, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. But this is what he says. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And no, that was not a thing about our border wall. It's different point here. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, so they said, Nehemiah went in. He says, you see the trouble we're in. Let us build. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Now, they saw the problems. They could have sat there and said, we're going to form a council. We're going to form a news committee that does nothing but talk of all the problems. And all the things that the people have done to create these problems. Rather than doing that, they said, let's build. Now, we don't want to be unrealistic and say that they went forward without any problems. Because it says that as they went forward to build what had been unjustly broken down they had enemies of God that were coming in left and right to try and stop them in this work they didn't want them to do this work and church you better understand the world as we're building up the nuclear family as we're building up biblical marriage as we're building up male and female made in the image of God as we're building up families that honor the Lord and his word we will not go forward without outside pressures we can expect our fair share of issues but notice what it says the text says those who carried burdens as they're building this wall bringing these those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other and each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built we need to be a people who have a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. No, we're not talking about a physical sword in this instance. We need to be a people who are armed and ready and understand the nature of what's happening. People who understand the times. People whose eyes are wide open and know how this is the answer. This is how we bring down arguments. Paul says, we, by the knowledge of Jesus Christ, destroy arguments and bring down strongholds, and we bring down every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we do it with the word of God. But that's only part of it. In the other hand, we need to be building. We can't only point out where we've gone wrong. We need to bring down the old structures so that we can build up something new. And so I'm calling us church to be a church with a sword and a trowel, one that will build with one hand and be willing to defend the people of God with the other. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and let me give you a, a passage of wisdom and I think also a passage of incentive. First Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse 10. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Now here's to us. Paul laid a foundation. Someone else is building upon it and he says let each one take care how he builds upon it for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid which is jesus christ he's our starting point he sets the square footage and the parameters and the shape of the structure that we're going to build it is built on jesus the wise man you know the kids the wise man built his house upon the rock and the you know the rains came tumbling down. The kids sing that in Bible class. No one can build. You can't build anything truly 
unless it's on top of Jesus Christ. You're building in, in air. You're building in thin air if you do. You're building in open space if you do. That's why every culture and every generation has a new framework of morality, and the next one comes along and it, it topples over. So if anyone builds on the foundation, verse 12, with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it. Because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Let me ask you. Maybe you need to go read it again. But how well does that passage inform everything that you put your hands to do going forward? How well does that passage inform why Paul said, whatever you do, do it mightily as for the Lord? Paul, Paul says, here's the foundation, it's Jesus Christ. We need to be building but take care how you build. Be careful how you build because what happens if you build with straw? How well will that structure stand the test of time? What, what child, what future generation wants to inherit a home made of straw or hay? And Paul is saying, take care, Christians, churches, church leaders as you're looking forward and you know we need to build we need to build the kingdom of jesus christ he's saying take care how you do it put real thought real consideration real concern into doing whatever you do excellently do it the best you possibly can this is going to inform and change the way that we do everything because there's not going to be a haphazard kind of building going forward there's not going to be a meandering kind of building process. We're going to build it with wood, and we're going to build it with stones, and we're going to build it with precious stones and with gold, where we're going to build something that people can look on it that, number one, the winds that they create culturally and ide ideologically won't be able to push it over, nor the people that are standing inside of it. But it's also going to be something that's so ornately decorated that people around are going to see it. And they may push against it, but they'll know there's something to what those people are doing. We're not talking about a physical building here, are we? We're talking about the beauty of the Lord's church. We're talking about the beauty and the productivity of the people of God, of a man of God or a woman of God or a business owner or a doctor or engineer or whoever who goes forward and says what i'm doing here is not for my boss it's for the lord jesus christ and i'm going to give him what he as king deserves when you when you have a whole church of christians in one area that have that mindset the world's going to start looking and they're going to say there's something different about those people look when we get to the end of our lives there's part of the there's, there's a dual incentive. One is you don't want your work to be burned up. And, and Paul's saying that's a possibility. You could labor your entire life. And if you didn't take care how you labored and what you did, and you did shoddy work and you did it haphazardly, you could get to the end of this life. And as the revealing of fire comes upon it, it could just destroy your work. You could look back at the end of your life and you could say, everything I labored for, everything I did, because I didn't do it, well is burned up now he's saying you may yourself be saved but all of your labors there'll be nothing to show for it there will be nothing that goes beyond your life the people to come after you won't benefit from it but we need to build everything excellently that's the call build excellently what this means is church where does it start there's four governments that god has created in this world the self the family, the church, and 
civil government. All of these governments created by God, created for God, and you have to begin in the self before you move to the family, before you move to the church, before you move to looking broadly at how this is going to be done. But, but that's how we would build. And so it would start in the self. It would start inside. The Romans had this idea that was called pietas, our English word piety. Not to be confused with the lesson that I did recently on pietism. It's a different idea. But it was this idea that the Romans had in Roman society that every man had and every woman had within themselves a duty, not only to themselves, but a duty to their family and a duty to their people. If we're going to build a good self, if we're going to, it, we're, we're going to start on the inside and we're going to say, I have obligations that go beyond myself. I, as a man, have obligations to those little boys that are sitting there. And to that little girl that's sitting there, I have obligations to look out for them. I have obligations to this church. I have obligations to this town and to this city to serve them well. That, that starts on the inside. And I, I believe the first place we build is we build inside the self. Be the best self you can possibly be. Master yourself. Bring yourself under control. And that is, after all, one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. We would build good homes. We would be hungry to be good husbands and hungry to be good wives and hungry to be good parents. We would have family mealtimes and daily devotions and a lot of family recreation, just spending time together in that way. We as parents would look on our children and we'd say, the most important thing I can do is instill virtue and a faith in God and a productive spirit into them. And so I'm going to do that as a parent. I'm going to actively teach them. And we're going to talk about these things every day because I want them to grow up. I have a duty to them and I have a duty to my society to create someone that's good and productive and law-abiding and going to help. <clears throat> we would develop elders as a church. If we want to be doing everything excellently, I was asking some guys recently, when's the best time to plant a tree? Was it 20 years ago? Isn't that what they say? But when is the second best time? To plant it now. You know what we need to be doing? We want to bless the church of tomorrow. We need to start training the young men. And I'm looking at you guys. And I'm looking around at some other fellas in here. We need to start training the young men right now and putting on them the weight of responsibility that they will inherit in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years when the church is in a position where they need elders, they need shepherds, they need people of wisdom who trained their whole lives under Christ as king and who said, I want to be a servant of the Lord so that those people in 40 years, the children in 40 years, and the people in that church will have spiritually minded, sound, literate, biblically uh, well-studied leaders and shepherds to look after the flock and to bring protection as shepherds should and do. And so the idea is, if we want to build a good church of tomorrow, start training elders right now. We, we, you may be a long ways from being an elder, but you've got to get it in your minds right now. I will be that leader one day because I owe it to the future church. I owe it to my Lord and Savior. He bought me with his precious blood. I will give him everything. What must I do? What can I do? I will prepare myself now, looking a long ways down the road. I believe also that we as a church would develop a totally, I want to say ridiculously, theologically robust curriculum. Because here's, here's the fact of the matter. We can sometimes look on secular institutions and look at the time, resources, energy, devotion that's being put into teaching secular topics. A ton of energy. Why should the church devote that much energy into our Sunday school classes? 
and the curriculum and the way that we're going to teach and really get together as leaders to say, what are third graders, fourth graders, fifth graders dealing with on the daily basis? What are they facing at school? How, what does the Bible say of it and how can we answer for those things? How can we prepare them for whatever it is that they're enduring? I believe that we would build the best Bible curriculum. We would build the best traditions church-wide, like koinonia. We would build Christian businesses amongst our members, which would operate on biblical principles, setting the standard for excellency and charity and ethics. We would build the best reputation in the community. And <clears throat> this, as you go back to the beginning of the lesson and you look at this vision, that's in my mind, and I hope now it's in your mind, of what we can be. Let's do it together. Let's rally side by side. Let's get together and let's do it. We owe it to those who are to come. Let's make Kingfisher a totally Christian city, beginning with the household of God. And let's make it such that we will truly be a city set on a hill. What if Kingfisher was known for this church around the nation? And we shined forth a light that was seen by everyone. I think we can do that. So let's do it together. Let's get on our knees and let's petition the Lord together. Let's see the greatness of the vision together. Let's build Christ's kingdom together. And we will hold a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. And I do believe the Lord will prosper us in this. Let's stand and sing.